Hey, this is Jim Leonard. I'm going to create a simple screencast to show you how to use the XDC encoder. Uh, this is the encoder that I created and used to create my demo 8088 Domination, which is a demo that plays uh, full screen, full motion video in graphics mode on uh, a 1981 IBM PC computer. Uh, I won't go into the details of how that system works. If you look at my channel, you can see other examples of that demo running as well as a link to my blog where I link to the write-up that explains uh, how I did that particular system. Um, this, using the encoder, the encoder is in a half-finished state, but I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to complete it. Uh, I would have liked to have created an all-in-one Windows tool where you just sit, suck in a video and have it spit out something already converted, but that will not be happening. Uh, so instead, I'm going to show you how to create a video from scratch uh, using the system and uh, hopefully this will supplement the documentation that I'm going to write that also explains uh, how to do it. And this is exactly how I do it. Uh, first you have to start with a video that is, uh, well, it would start with any video really, and uh, what I'm going to do is pull up a video that uh, I like to use as source material. This is a section of Tron. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at this video. Um, I have it, it, it doesn't matter what size it is, but because the graphics mode that uh, uh, the XTC system uses is no bigger than 32200, I like to resize my videos to 32200 when I'm doing, uh, when I'm getting the source video ready. Uh, the frame rate can be any frame rate you want, as long as it's above probably 4 frames a second, and it can go all the way up to 60. Um, and what I'm going to do is, uh, the XTC encoder is actually a, <laughs> it's a DOS program. That's because when I originally designed it and started to write it, uh, I was going to use the timing of the code it produces on the system itself as a way to tune. Now I've since changed that so that it doesn't, you don't have to encode on the slow machine itself. But it is a DOS program. It doesn't load AVI files directly, so what you have to do is export a series of bitmaps. This, the bitmaps have to be in a very specific format, and that is what the majority of this screencast is going to show you. Uh, what I like to do is, um, when I have a source video that I want to encode, first I, ha I export all of the frames as ping files. There's probably a very easy way to do this with Image Magic or FFmpeg. Um, I'm just going to show you how to do this completely with graphical tools so that if you have no experience whatsoever with command line tools or Linux or whatever, you can still do this. So Virtual Dub is a fantastic uh, open source program that lets you manipulate video. And uh, you may not know this, but it can also output image sequences. And that's what we're going to do to extract uh, the video. Now let me first prepare, uh, excuse me, let me prepare a location. This is all from scratch. I haven't done any of this. Uh, with this specific video, so this will be, you can get to see this uh, beginning to end. So let's just go ahead and create a, uh, let's call it uh, Tron Disk. Let's create a folder for it. And then let's uh, export every single frame in this video as an image sequence. And let's pick the uh, location. Sorry about this, this is uh, me navigating my directory tree here. Let's pick uh, the directory where this stuff is going to go and again this is a, a DOS based encoder so you're going to have to limit the uh, file names so let's just call this TD like Tron disk and we can see it's got a little under 1200 frames let's save ourselves a little space make it that okay so this is going to export all of the frames in ping and there it goes and then what we have to do with these exported frames and we, just, we have to convert them to a very specific format. The format is uh, either no dither or an ordered dither. You cannot use a Floyd Steinberg dither for this. It has to be ordered or it has to be no dithering at all and it has to follow a very specific color palette. Uh, the color palette in particular, now let's see actually let's check that. Did, did it in fact create our frames? Yes it did. There's actually one more thing we might as well do as long as we're here. Sorry, let's load this back into Virtual Dub. And while we're here, uh, let's also extract the audio. And let's go to Trondis and we'll just call it, we'll just have the raw audio for now. And I'll post process that later and I'll show you how to do that too. So 
Uh, now that we've created our frames, we have to convert them to uh, a very specific format. The CGA 16 color uh, palette is in fact this exactly, and this should be included if you want to. And it's these col it's not only these colors, but it's these quarters in this e exact uh, order. This is color index 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., down to 15. Um, the files that you can feed into the encoder are uh, 160 by 200 by 16 colors, an 8 bit bitmap format. Uh, using this palette above. Uh, and you can also do the same thing in 160 by 100 by 16. And what that will do is it'll skip every other line. And you would use that for videos that change pretty much every single pixel on every single frame. Uh, there's no way that the, that the regular bandwidth of the system can handle a 200 line file. So if you want, you can give it a 100 line file, it'll work. Again, this also has to be an 8 bit bitmap using the above. Uh, palette. So that's what we have to convert to. And by 8-bit I mean it's there are actually 256 colors in the bitmap but only the first 16 are used and only the first 16 are these specific palette entries. So there are probably a multitude of ways you can do this using uh, maybe image magic. I know that it likes to reduce palettes. Um, I haven't tried it. Um, I was going to write my own program ba uh, that did order dithering, but um, I have to I have to move on to other projects, and so I won't be doing it this time. There is, if you have Photoshop, uh, believe it or not, there's a way to do this in Photoshop. So let's go ahead and explore that now. So let's fire up Photoshop. What you can do, Photoshop, you may not think of it as a uh, image manipulate like a batch imi image manu uh, excuse me <laughs> batch image manipulation program but you can do it uh, first let's load up one of those sample files uh, so we can take a look where's our Tron disk here it is and actually what the heck let's just fire up the first one this is a disk now here's the extracted frame now you can create a macro that will um, do the proper dither with the proper palette and then you can tell Photoshop to run that macro on every file in a directory and then save it so we're gonna do that now I know this is very convoluted but if you have no experience with command line tools uh, you too can still create your own videos so uh, first we resize it to 160 by 200 and that should do it fine. Be because the resolution is so low it really doesn't matter how you're going to resample this, so we'll just leave it at by cubic. So now we're at the correct resolution and then we... Oh, by the way, I'm showing you all these steps not in a macro, just so you can... so I can explain them a little slower. Then we want to change the mode to indexed color where we load our own palette. You do custom for the palette and you can define this manually. I've gone ahead and done this manually in a color um, you can store palettes so you, they uh, for some reason they're called ACT I don't know why that is so you can actually pr in Photoshop you can create and save a palette out of uh, out of a file so I've actually done that sorry that's the wrong one that is the 16 color palette I'm looking for the uh, CGA composite palette so here's the palette uh, and I'll make these. I'll make this file available too, in case you don't want to go creating all the things. And then you have to do pattern. The reason you do pattern is because that is Thomas Knoll's indexed uh, uh, order dithering pattern. If you do nothing, it looks like this. It remaps just each color to its closest equivalent. And you can do that. Um, it will compress pretty well using the XDC system, but generally you want to do pattern because it is an order dither that will look much better but still not have very many changes per frame. You cannot use an error diffusion dither because if you do, I know it looks nicer but this is sort of random, all this distribution of dots and in the final output this will be a swimmy mess of random noise. It won't compress at all and it'll look terrible so we want to do pattern and then that's it and then we save it. Now if we had to do this manually for every frame uh, that would suck balls. So obviously we're not going to do that. Uh, what we will do instead is create a macro. So uh, I won't walk you through uh, recording and saving a macro. Um, if you have Photoshop you probably know how to do that. Um, but as you can see I've created one right here 
and it does exactly what we did. It does the image resize, and then it does the uh, convert to index color with the palette, and then the order dither. So my macro is all set. And in Photoshop, the automation is hiding under File, Automate, Batch. And uh, this is pretty much it. From the set, from the macro set default actions, we do our, the macro that we've created with those options. Uh, the source is a folder, and we're going to pick the folder we created with our frames in it. And then the destination is just save it and close it. And if there are any errors, uh, please uh, log them to a file and um, you know what, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave it. Um, I'm, this won't create any, I mean if there are any errors they'll be in this file. Uh, I'm not gonna bother because I know this is probably gonna work. And then you hit OK and then after a few seconds of churning you can see it's just automatically loading, con running the macro, saving. So uh, let's use a handy dandy clock wipe to simulate the passage of time so you don't have to watch this work. And Photoshop is now done. That didn't actually didn't take that long. It took only maybe about two or three minutes. Um, but it's finished, so let's exit Photoshop and let's take a look uh, at the files that were created. And let's pull one of these up just to make sure it worked properly. It did. And now, unfortunately, again, I did not have time to write a ping reader. If I had, then all you would do is feed these directly in. Um, all I had time to do was write a very quick bitmap reader, so uh, we now have to convert these to bitmaps. However, that's easy to do with uh, several free tools. Um, I'm going to go ahead and use Earth and View. Earth and View has it. Now, you may be wondering why couldn't I have used Photoshop to do this? And you can use Photoshop, but every time you save a file for, to a bitmap in Photoshop that has less, it has a um, that's like, for example, 256 color, but it only uses 16 colors. It asks you if you want to save it as a 4 or an 8-bit bitmap, and I couldn't figure out a way to automate that. So we'll just use Earth and View. It's a free program. It's really easy to use. Hitting the letter B will fire up the batch uh, conversion menu. And so, oh, look at that. We're right here in uh, right where we need to be. You navigate to where the ping files are. You tell it you want ping. You can add them all to the batch. And then you just pick... Uh, Windows bitmap and use the current directory where I found those files and then start batch and go and then probably before I have time to finish this sentence it will finish converting all the pings into there it is 256 color bitmaps now just to ensure that these are of the correct uh, format we're gonna load up one of these bitmaps into Photoshop and manually look. First of all, it looks fine, and then we're going to check the color table to make sure that it is in fact correct. So it is. So it's using the correct palette entries in the correct order. These are now files that we are ready to use with the encoder. But wait, there's still a few things we need to do. Remember the audio? Well, the audio here is here in a WAV file. All you have to do is convert this to 8-bit and because the sound blaster uh, that this system uses is only uh, current, I, it, it may work with 16-bit. I haven't tested that code in a very long while. And besides, I think it's extremely difficult, if not impossible, to get a 16-bit, a like, a, like a sound blaster 16 working um, in an old computer. I know that you can, you can plug a 16-bit ISA card into an 8-bit slot. Um, but I don't know if the 16-bit sound works, so we're just going to do 8-bit. So, you have to convert this to 8-bit. You can use any program in the whole world you want. I'm going to go ahead and use Audition, which some of you may remember as Cool Edit. Audacity would work great for this, too. All you have to do is convert it to 8-bit. So this is the audio. And this is awfully quiet. Let me make sure this is the right audio. Yep, that's it. Um, it's awfully quiet, so I am going to... Um, make it louder before the conversion because if you leave it that quiet um, there's, uh, going from 16-bit to 8-bit is really gonna uh, you'll, you'll barely be able to hear anything so uh, so let's convert this to 8-bit it's gonna be mono I'm sorry it has to be mono 8-bit you can pick any uh, sample rate you want up to what a sound blaster can support the maximum a sound blaster can do 
uh, is actually a very strange uh, hertz, which is 45454. That's the actual maximum that a Sound Blaster Pro or 2.0 or Sound Blaster 16 can do. Just for simplicity's sake, I'm going to pick 22050. And that should do it. Bit depth 8, mono. So let's convert that. And save that to a new file. And let's go ahead and save it as trondisk underscore 22050.wave. Again, you have to stick with 8.3 file names for use of the encoder, because the encoder still, as of, as of this recording, is for 16-bit DOS. I know that's a hassle. I'm sorry. Um, I did it in a hurry. <laughs> uh, maybe at some point I'll convert it or someone else will convert it to a nice graphical GUI that will work in Windows or Linux, but for right now this is the limitation. So trondisk underscore 22050, save it, and we are done with this phase. So now we have everything we need to make a movie. We have frames in the correct format and we have audio in the correct format. Now we need to create an input script to the XDC encoder. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and fire an environment that I can work in. Uh, this is just a DOS box window. Uh, let's get rid of these icons. You can do, I mean, you can do this however you like. I'm just going to do it in DOS box so that I can just stay in the same environment. Um, so the script has a couple of things in it, like what is the source frame rate? What is, where's the wave file? And then every line after some directives uh, is interpreted as an input frame. Uh, so let's go ahead and create a script for this little Tron disk video. Uh, if I take a look at uh, all of the bitmaps, so they are there. Uh, DOS has a dash b command line that will only output the raw files, so that's that's good. We're going to use that, and let's create a Tron disk input script with those, and let's go ahead and edit the script so we can put the proper paths on it and also add other information. Uh, I'm using a tiny little editor I've been using for, gosh, almost 25 years now called SLED. You can use, of course, any editor you want. Let's go ahead and put the full path. I'm going to do a search and replace on this so I can make sure that the full path is referenced. I don't want to have all these bitmap files in the, in the directory I'm working in. So um, for every TD, please replace it with the full path. And that did not work, probably because it's case sensitive. That's better. So now we have all the frames. And then at the top of the script, let's save this. For the top of the script, uh, we need to have a couple of things that are mandatory. What is the source frame rate? And I know in this video it's 23.976. That's why I looked at it in virtual dub to check before we started this process. Uh, you then also have to put the screen mode that you converted for. There's actually a third black and white mode that the encoder uses. I'm not going to cover it here, um, but the conversion process is, is pretty much identical. You just have to save in a different format. Uh, you can consult the documentation if you want to use the black and white mode. So the screen mode is going to be uh, one for color. Uh, that's the 160 by 200 by 16 color composite output. Finally, we have to tell it where the wave input's coming from. And we call it TD22050, if I remember correctly. Okay, and at that point, you can go ahead and just simply encode. That's all you need to do. There are many other parameters you can put into the script uh, to control what's going on. Uh, you can use comments, you can switch up parameters halfway through if you want, but for now this alone should do it. And then all you have to do is run it through with the encoder. So let's do that now. I've already compiled it and we're going to do feed it Tron disk and hit go. And as you can see there it goes. It's encoding. It's a little slow in DOSBox. DOSBox even set to maximum speed uh, DOSBox only has fast emulation of 32-bit instructions because it passes those on to the host environment and executes them. Um, I believe that's how it works. Uh, for 16-bit, unfortunately, everything is emulated, so this is running a lot slower than it could. If you run a uh, 
a virtual session like Windows XP and VirtualBox or something like that, then you can get this to run much, much faster. So this is going to, it's analyzing the differences between frames, it's figuring out the best possible way to encode those differences within the bandwidth limits that we've given it. The default limits, uh, the defaults built into the program are mostly sufficient for running off of a homebrew adapter such as the XTIDE or James Pierce's excellent uh, XTIDE CF cards, the compact flash equivalents. Um, if you have an actual stock MFM controller uh, or you're trying to encode video for playing off of a CD-ROM then you'll probably want to modify those controls and I'll go ahead and do this uh, after this video is done encoding. So let's use another magical clock wipe to simulate the passage of time and take a look at this uh, when it's finished. Okay, encoding finished. And the default setting, uh, the output of the encoder, is after it, not only does it produce the uh, XDV file, which is the muxed video and audio file, but it also produces a log file. Uh, you can turn that off by setting debug to zero in the script, but I like to leave it on because uh, the log file has a, a great deal of information in it. For example, uh, we can see here uh, how many <laughs> how many cycles per frame we have when you set the encoding FPS. If you if you're interested in that, if there's uh, anything up with the audio, it'll tell you. For example, uh, the way that the player w is able to function as quickly as it does is it uses the sound card interrupt to drive the entire system and that me and it can and the sound card interrupt uh, works on a double buffering system this is also uh, known as auto init dma if you're familiar with that in the uh, uh, from the old dos days and the buffer needs to be exactly the same size if you provide a frame rate and a sample rate that doesn't divide nice and evenly um, then the encoder will adjust and then it will also either drop or duplicate frames in order to maintain audio sync. Uh, if you don't trust the encoder to do this properly and you're doing something really long like a 30 minute video then uh, feel free to use both a, a frame rate and a sample rate that do divide evenly. For example 22050 divided by 30 frames a second, 30 even, not 29.97, results in an exact, results in uh, 735 and it's a nice even multiple and nothing happens. So if there's any issues with the encoding it'll be in the log file um, but there weren't any so let's just skip to the end and you get some interesting information such as um, out of a source frame rate of 20 of 24 roughly 24 um, it was only able to show 19 unique frames so occasionally when there's not enough bandwidth to show something it will it will have to spend an additional frame uh, showing the rest of something. Uh, we get disk I/O stats. Now, uh, this is pretty. So the average is the the excuse me. The encoder is a is a variable frame rate encoder. Sorry, a variable bit rate encoder. Um, it uses more bits if necessary. It also imposes a, a maximum limit. So you can set you you can't control currently anyway the average bit rate. Uh, of the file, but you can limit it so you can specify the maximum. Now this maximum right here um, is very high. In fact, even with a homebrew adapter, it is possible that some sections won't play, even even buffering with 512k of RAM, they may not play properly. So we can do a couple of things to our source material. Let's go ahead and bring up the script again. Uh, we can do things such as set the maximum uh, disk bandwidth rate in K. So, for example, if I wanted to make sure that this file were playable, uh, if the resulting file were playable on a CD-ROM, I could limit it to 150K a second. If I wanted to limit it to uh, an old MFM hard drive, I could limit it to 90K a second. I suppose if you were a glutton for punishment, you could limit it to a floppy disk, which would be about either 12 or 18K a second, depending on your medium. Um, don't do that because it most likely uh, will break. But uh, why don't we set something a little bit more reasonable? And then I'm also going to show you uh, something else. Uh, this can also help with keeping the frame rate down. Um, if you have 
uh, not an animation, but a full screen, constantly changing, real world video, like a movie. Uh, you can also tell it to perform an optimization called shaving deltas. And if you turn on shave deltas, what this will do is any th any change on the screen that is uh, two bytes or less will be completely thrown away. And that gives the encoder more time and bandwidth to concentrate on the areas of the screen that are changing the most, which is what you're going to notice most in a video. So if you do this, uh, why don't we do this, save it, and re-encode again, and we'll take a look at what the results are. So, already you can see that static areas, hardly anything is changing, but you may notice that they also change like once every 24 frames. So, what Shave Deltas does is it throws those away, it, shows it throws tiny changes away, but because if you do that, you may leave trails on the screen because little changes to erase those trails aren't there either that the whole screen eventually will get kind of messy and distorted so once every uh, in this video once every second once every second of playback a full complete frame is encoded this is known in the video compression world as a keyframe so shave deltas turns on uh, keyframing and if you find that shaving deltas is too severe, you can shave individual pixels. That is in the script file, shave pixels. And shave pixels uh, will only encode a, uh, a byte if more than one pixel is changing. If only one pixel changed, it'll throw that one pixel change away. So it's still encoding. And uh, let's use the magic of uh, time dilation clock wipes to skip to the end of the encoding here. Okay, encoding finished. Let's go ahead and take a look at the log and see if uh, our changes made a difference. And in fact, they have. Uh, you can see in the average disk I.O. is lower. The maximum, most importantly, is lower. We set max disk rate to 150. It's now 143. And uh, as a result, the file also went down a little bit in size. Now. Let's go ahead and switch to a different version, to a different uh, instance of DOSBox, so that I can show you what this looks like when you play it back. Okay, so I've created a DOSBox configuration file. Let's get our icons back here. Um, that closely simulates an IBM uh, from 1981 with just a CGA and uh, and a sound blaster, and I've set the cycles slow. Uh, 312 is, by my measure, about as close to an XT as you can get with DOSBox. And uh, one of the reasons I did this is so that I can actually test the output closer in its native environment. Um, transferring it to my actual old machine for testing uh, can take a while. Um, I have to pull out a compact flash card connected to another PC and transfer and so on. Or I can do it over a network, but it's nice to be able to preview uh, from the same system you encoded the video on. Uh, so I've switched into this old-school configuration for DOSBox, and uh, let's go ahead and play the resulting file. And give it a shot. So that's the output of our encoding. Hey, who's that guy? That's Tron. He fights for the users. Oh. Okay. So not too shabby. And when this is over, I'll go ahead and comment a little on some of the output here. Okay, so a couple of notes. Uh, you may have noticed that in the full screen area where they were uh, walking past and they said, who's that? And he says, it's Tron. He fights for the users. Um, that may have been very slow. That's because uh, with our lowered bit rate, our max disk rate set to 150, there's just simply too many, even with shaved deltas on there, just simply too many changes. 
So that section ran at less than the full 24 frames a second. It probably had an effective frame rate of about 12 or maybe even 6 at times. But uh, for the most part, um, pretty nice. So I hope that that gives you an end-to-end -end example of how to use the XDC encoder. Again, I apologize for it being 16-bit and so difficult to convert and use to, but if you want to use it, uh, you can. Uh, the source code is up on GitHub, and I'm hoping that someone will take my write-up and the source code and create a nice all-in-one tool that from the you know command line will take an AVI file and spit out an XDC file. But, uh, you know, don't hold your breath. <laughs>